Okay, good morning. Today we're going to get to what I consider to be kind of the punchline of the course, what we've been working up to uh, from the very beginning. Um, and uh, so we, we've almost completed Maxwell's equations and then we're gonna use them to actually be able to talk about electromagnetic radiation, which is, I think, probably the most interesting topic in this entire course. Um, you may remember that uh, at the beginning of the semester, the very first lecture, we started with uh, a demonstration of a kind of a, an interesting object. It was a, a transmitter, a little antenna, that actually allowed us to light a light bulb that was just connected to two wires. It wasn't connected to anything else. So let me remind you of this by just showing you a clip from the uh, from from that from that lecture. Okay, so here's a here's a video of this lecture. The this device here is an antenna. The thing I'm holding is a light bulb in a socket that's just connected to two wires and not anything else. So let's look at this for just a minute. Um, if I hold the light bulb here, you may be able to see that it's actually lighting, even though we're not connecting it to anything. Now there's a sort of a more macho version of the same thing. It's just, this looks more, this is harder to understand. It is a light bulb connected to two metal rods Okay, so it's not lighting either by itself, <coughs> but it's just a little <laughs> brighter. And if we put it here, <clears throat> there we go. If we put it here, we see that it actually does light up, even though it's not connected to anything. And that's not because it's, there's something magic in that box, because that's true of this, there we go, this light bulb also. <clears throat> But if we rotate it 90 degrees, it goes out. <clears throat> so that's more interesting. So we saw um, a light bulb connected to two wires lighting, even though it wasn't connected to anything else. Now we understand a lot more about what's going on in that in that light bulb and wires than we did before. We understand that in order for the light bulb to light, there has to be a non-zero electric field in the bulb uh, in order to drive a current through the light bulb. And the, because the light bulb is has an incredibly thin filament, the resistance of the filament is high. Uh, a lot of energy is, kinetic energy of electrons flowing with, through the filament is lost through collisions with the lattice. Uh, the lattice gets very hot and vibrates and emits photons um, in the visible range that you can actually see. So we know there has to be a non-zero electric field there, uh, but it's a little unclear still how we could make an electric field there without attaching that light bulb to some sort of power source, a battery. However, we're on the edge of understanding what's happening there. Uh, we're on the edge of being able to understand where that electric field is coming from and then how it's produced. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the goal for today. We do know already that a time varying magnetic field can be responsible for an electric field, but that's a, that's a curly electric field. And we certainly didn't have any loop for current to go around because the two ends of the wires connected to the light bulb were just hanging there. They weren't, they weren't actually connected to each other or anything. So it's not quite as simple as that. And so our goal for today is to talk about uh, electromagnetic radiation and a possible source of the electric field that drives the current in that device. So that's today's goal. 
so um, I'm going to switch cameras here because I want to be able to write on the screen. Um, so let's review where we've gotten to in our understanding of patterns of uh, field and sources of fields. So we, uh, we've seen that there are different kinds of fields. There's electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, the field has effects on, it affects other things, and it's, it's made by some source. So electric fields, we knew, affect other charges, and the source is, is some charge, but we also know that it's also possible now that we could have a time-varying magnetic field that could make that electric field. And likewise, we have magnetic fields. Uh, a magnetic fields affects other moving charges. A source is a moving charge. And by symmetry, uh, we might guess that it's also possible that a that a time varying um, electric field might actually produce a magnetic field or be associated with a magnetic field, and that turns out to be correct, uh, and we can see kind of that it has to be true with the following sort of thought example. So let's consider a wire that has current flowing through it. We have a conventional current I flowing that way. There's a capacitor which is initially uncharged and then more wire. Now, um, as, as the current flows, the capacitor charges. So charge builds up in the capacitor, changing the current through the wire. Now at any instant, we know that, that this current in the wire makes a magnetic field that curls around the wire so that, uh, let's see, for a current, for a location on top of the wire, the magnetic field would be out of the screen. Let's make that a little darker. Out of the screen, uh, for a location underneath the wire, the magnetic field would be into the screen. Um, and, and we'd have, in fact, this sort of pattern of curly pattern of magnetic field around the wire. Now, since all parts of the the, the current in the wire contribute to the magnetic field everywhere along here, it's also clearly going to be the case that there's a magnetic field in the region of the capacitor too. So up here, uh, the, the, the even within the capacitor, just outside the capacitor, there's certainly going to be a magnetic field out and down here there's going to be a magnetic field in because we have this current all the way along the wire. However, we have a problem with our current formulation of Ampere's law here, because if we draw an Ampere's law path around the wire here,
I'll remind you that Ampere's law relates the the dot product of the magnetic field around a, a closed loop to the current passing through the loop. That's all fine. We have a current passing through the loop here. There's a magnetic non-zero magnetic field around the loop. That looks fine. But if we draw our Am Ampere's law path inside the capacitor, we may have an issue. So let's, let's blow up the capacitor here. And now suppose we drew our, our Ampere's law path in a circle here. This is, that circle is supposed to be perpendicular here. The circle is supposed to be, look like it's coming out of the page and okay. Okay, so we draw our Ampere's path here. We know there's a magnetic field here because of all the rest of the wire. So we have um, the integral of V dot DL is not zero here. But there is no current. inside here. And it was James Clark Maxwell, a Scots physicist, who said, well, I know about Faraday's law and I know that a time varying magnetic field can be associated with an electric field. So I know there's also here a time varying electric field inside the capacitor. Uh, because we have positive charge building up here. So we have positive charge building up here. We have negative charge building up here. We have an electric field here. And E uh, varies with time because as charge builds up on the capacitor because of this current flowing, um, then the field gets stronger. So, and so Maxwell suggested that we should change Ampere's law so that instead of uh, just saying the, the sum of B dot DL around a closed loop was equal to mu naught times the current through the loop, he felt that we should have a term that um, was related to the change of the electric flux within this loop. So we have a rate of change of the electric flux inside the loop. And it turns out there that uh, we need a factor epsilon zero in front of that. So this is the ampere Ampere Maxwell law. So time varying E um, the time varying electric field also is associated with this curly magnetic field. And, and so now we have this symmetrical situation in terms of sources. Um, so uh, we can actually make our table here a little bit better. And so here's, so we finally are in a position to write down all of Maxwell's equations. Um, these are the the equations that relate possible patterns of field and space to 
the sources of those fields. And we've sort of built them up one at a time from things we already knew. The first was Gauss's law. And we saw that that relates the electric flux over a closed surface uh, the 3D closed surface to the charge inside the surface divided by epsilon zero. And we also had Gauss's law for magnetism. Which says that if we um, add up the magnetic flux over a closed surface, we shouldn't find any magnetic monopoles inside. Uh, as far as we know, there aren't any. So no magnetic monopoles, no, no north poles without south poles. Whereas we have electric monopoles, those are just positive and negative charges. Um, we have Faraday's law, which says that the integral of the electric field along a closed path, some closed loop, is equal to the negative of the rate of change of the magnetic flux over some bounded surface. We can also write this as, as um, uh, this is going to be the EMF because the integral of the, the integral of any Coulomb field, any field made by charges around a closed path is zero, and what's left is the integral of this non-Coulomb field around the closed path, and that's the EMF is equal to um, the rate of change of magnetic flux. And then we have the Ampere-Maxwell law, which we just saw. which says that the integral of magnetic field around a closed path is equal to mu zero times the current enclosed or the rate of change of the magnetic flux, of the electric flux, sorry, over the surface bounded by that path. So we have um, Okay, so there's a certain symmetry here. Um, we have we have a time varying magnetic field basically that has associated with an electric field. We have a time varying electric field that that's associated with a magnetic field. The, the asymmetry here, um, this, this current term, this is a flow of, of electric monopoles, charged particles. And we don't see a current term in Faraday's law because as far as we know, there aren't any magnetic monopoles. No one's ever found a North Pole without a South Pole. If there were any, then there'd be a, a magnetic current term in here, but, but we don't think there are any. So what if what 
we had a time varying magnetic field that varied with time in such a way that it made an electric field that's also time varying. So now we'd have time varying electric field that makes a magnetic field. But if that magnetic field is time varying, then we have a dBdt, which makes an electric field. So we have this time varying electric field that, that made a time varying magnetic field, that makes a time varying electric field, that makes a time varying magnetic field. We wouldn't even need any charges. These time varying fields could just create and sustain each other, maybe, if this is consistent with Maxwell's equations, if we can come up with a pattern of field that actually is consistent with Maxwell's equations. So what we're going to do today is we're going to postulate a, configure, a possible configuration of electric and magnetic fields in space that that satisfies this relation, uh, show that it, it's consistent with Maxwell's equations, that it satisfies Maxwell's equations, and then see what we can learn about what would have to be true for this to happen. So nothing up either sleeve. So the configuration of field we are going to look at, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute so I can show you a V Python program. Um, all right. This is one of the demo programs from. Um, Okay, so let me share my screen again. Or did I ever stop? Okay, I wanna, uh, I wanna share this. So what we're going to have here is just a pulse of uh, electro of of electric field and magnetic field, but it's going to be traveling in space. So the orange arrows are electric field. The uh, the blue arrows, the cyan arrows are magnetic field. You can see that they're at right angles to each other. And they're actually traveling through space. So there's, there's a region where the fields are non zero here. And then if we wait long enough, they're zero again. So you can imagine being an observer standing here in the middle of the screen, you don't see anything, you don't see anything. Oh, suddenly you see electric field and magnetic field. Now you don't see anything anymore. So this is the, the configuration of fields we're going to consider. Electric field and magnetic field at right angles through a particular region and that whole region actually traveling through space. And we'll show that uh, this works with Maxwell's equations and that that would in fact give us possibly an explanation of how we can light the light bulb in that demo without uh, a battery. Okay, so let's go back to the whiteboard here. 
and let me refine the chat window. So if you have questions, I can see them. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna consider this pulse traveling through space. It's a, it's a, a slab, a sort of um, 3D slab of space, rectangular slab of space. Um, we have in this region electric field pointing up. We have magnetic field pointing out toward us. And this whole thing is moving to the right with speed V. And so if you, uh, you're an observer and you stand here, um, with your proton on a spring. So here's your, your proton on a spring, the detector of electric field. And you wait for this thing to go by and you sort of, you plot here um, electric field that you observe versus time what you'd see is nothing, 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 nothing. And then you'd see electric field in the plus y direction. So we'll call this E sub y. And then after the pulse has gone by, you wouldn't see anything. Or if you were observing magnetic field, um, you'd see uh, this would be a B sub z, wouldn't it? So P sub Z. If you're observing magnetic field, you'd see nothing, 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 and then you'd see pulse. And, okay. So the question is, uh, does this violator satisfy Maxwell's equations? So let's just take them one at a time and we'll see. So for Gauss's law, um, so Gauss's law, we'll draw our, our surface, Gaussian surface entirely within this, this region of space here. So we've got electric field that's pointing up everywhere. And if we consider the electric flux, it looks like the electric flux on the top is positive. And the electric flux on the sides is zero because uh, everywhere here it's E is perpendicular to n hat on the sides, whereas up here we have n hat up. And on the bottom, the electric flux must be negative because the electric field is up, but n hat is down. And so the net electric flux is zero. And so there are no charges in the region. And that's good because that's what we postulated, right? And for Gauss's law for magnetism, we'll take the same surface. And now we've got uh, 
magnetic field out here. And let's draw this back surface here. The magnetic field this way, magnetic field this way. Let me redraw this so it's a little bit bigger and a little less messy. Okay, so here's our Gauss's surface. In the front, we have magnetic field out. On the sides, we have magnetic field there. On the back, we have magnetic field in. On the top, okay, so the magnetic field is uniformly pointing in the plus C direction. And so on the, the top and the sides, um, we have zero flux. On the front, we have positive flux. On the back, we have negative flux. So we have phi front is greater than zero plus top and the sides um, is equal to zero. And then the back, we have negative flux. So that's zero, so no magnetic monopoles. And that's good because we're not postulating any. So now we have to look at Faraday's law. And for Faraday's law, what we're going to do is this. We're going to take our region of space here. Um, and we're going to draw, our, we need a closed path here to, to get um, the integral of e dot dl over. And so what we're going to do is draw a rectangular path that's kind of an interesting one. Let's make it that color. Um, because it's going to come out, so it's going to be in the xy plane. It's going to be partly inside this region where the fields are non-zero and partly outside the region. And so what we want to do is look at the integral of e dot dl around this and relate it to the rate of change of magnetic flux over this path. So for Faraday's law, we have um, our path that looks like this. Now I'm just going to draw a 2D slice here. So that's our path. And here's our region with non-zero fields. And so in this piece of the region, we have electric field up and we have magnetic field out. And so what we want to do here is we want to take the integral of E dot DL around the path and relate it to uh, the rate of change of the magnetic flux through this surface stretched over this magenta rectangle. And so for the calculation, um, and hat is, is going to be pointing out toward us. However, to get a rate of change, we actually need to look at, at two instants here. So here's our first instant. Let me move this up out of the way a little bit. So I can redraw it a moment later. So this is time 
t equals one. And to get change, we're gonna have to um, And and oh the uh, this region is moving that way. So at time t equals one, we're here. At time t equals two, here's our path. But now this region of non-zero field has actually moved a little farther to the right. So before it only went to here, but now it goes to here. So now we have um, we have this this non-zero electric field, we have magnetic field, and we have this this new piece of the region here uh, that has new new piece with non-zero flux. Okay. So let's see if we can figure out the rate of change of magnetic flux here. So we want Well, at time, so we need some dimensions here. Let's call this dimension the height. And uh, we'll call this distance here x. And this is still the height. This distance is x. And we'll call this new little piece delta x. So at time t equals one, the magnetic flux is going to be b dot n hat b, and so it's going to be b times the magnitude of n hat, which is one times cosine of zero degrees, uh, times the area where there's non-zero so this is b dot n hat. And the area is going to be h times x at t equals 1. Yeah, so the Faraday path is, remember, it's a path. So a path is, a, is inherently a 2D thing, right? So what we did is, here's our 3D region of space up here. And what we did is, is decide to form a wire into a rectangle, an imaginary wire. And so we have this basically 2D figure and, and it's slid in, it's, it's, it's oriented in such a way that the, the path is in the, the XY plane. Um, and it's it the path is remaining still, so we we put our path into space, and it's remaining still. And what's happening is since this region of non-zero field is moving, the region of non-zero field slides along into the region where our path is drawn. So that's what Hendrick said is right. And so in fact, it is it's a two D slice of the world um, and the box of box in which there is non-zero field is kind of moving on to the path. Is that semi-clear? Okay. All right. 
So we got the flux at times t equals one. We can get the magnetic flux at times t equals two because it's still gonna be B times the magnitude of N hat, which is one times the cosine of zero degrees. <clears throat> and now the area over which there's non-zero flux is actually H times X plus delta X. So the area over which there's non-zero flux got bigger. So the change in magnetic flux over delta T is going to be equal to final minus initial flux. So we have um, B times H, B times H times X plus delta x minus b times h times x over delta t, which just gives us a b h delta x over delta t. But this delta x over delta t, that's just v, the speed. So we can write this as BHB. So the right-hand side of our Faraday's law equation is equal to rate of change of the magnetic flux. And now we have to take the integral of, of E dot DL to get the left-hand side. So this is the right-hand side of Faraday's law. The integral of E dot DL. Well, let's look at our path here. Along this left side, Uh, we have, we're going to go uh, <clears throat> oh. since we're working here with magnitudes, it doesn't matter. This would be, if our path is counterclockwise, this would be a minus E times H. <clears throat> So this is the left edge. And then along the bottom, um, we have E is perpendicular to DL. So E dot DL is zero because here in our in our diagram we have we have e pointing up but dl going that way so it's zero on the right side the right edge e equals zero so that's a zero. And on the top, we have, uh, again, we've got E up and DL to the left. So we have a zero. Whoops. So that's equal to a, a minus EH. And since we're since we're taking magnitudes here, then we can set EH is equal to BHV. Or 
E is equal to P times V. So what, what good does this do? What, what was the point of this? Well, this tells us that this configuration of fields is okay with Faraday's law if and only if the magnitude of the electric field is equal to the speed times uh, the, the magnitude of the magnetic field in this region. So this must be true. Questions about that? Okay. So we have one more equation to worry about. We have uh, Ampere Maxwell. And what that says is, so let's draw how we're gonna, we, and we need another path here. So here's our region of space with fields in it. We have E up and uh, B coming out. And this time we're gonna draw our path in the XZ plane. So we're gonna make our path um, The, the, the plane of the path is perpendicular to the electric field here. And the magnetic field is in the path. Right, yeah, this is, this is the standard units of, of E and B. So this is whatever unit system you're using. It's, it's uh, in this case, it's SI units, yep. So, now, notice that this is only true, we've, we've decided this has to be true if what we've got is this, this slab, this region of non-zero field moving to the right with, with constant V, okay? So if that's true, if we, if we had such a region, that would be okay as long as the magnitude of E is equal to the magnitude of B times the speed of, of, of traveling. Now we're gonna do exactly the same thing with Ampere's law that we did with, with Faraday's law. So let's write down the Ampere-Maxwell law, the integral of V dot DL is equal to mu zero times the current inside plus epsilon zero times the rate of change of electric flux. So I'm gonna redraw this path as if we were sitting up here on the plus y axis looking down. Um, so, so from the viewpoint of, of somewhere looking down from plus y axis. So here's our path. Uh, we have, we now have electric field out and magnetic field is down. And as before, the path is fixed in space. Um, but the region of field is, is traveling to the right at this same speed V. So I've just redrawn it from a different perspective here. And then, so we still have the same, we're gonna have the same dimensions here. This can be H, this can be X. Um, and then uh, with some 
slightly later time. We have an H. The uh, this region of non-zero field has has moved a little bit to the right. So before we had um, oops before we had uh, this much of the region filled with non-zero flux, but now we have this additional piece. And so this is, this distance is X and this is Delta X. Okay, so the right hand side, the rate of change of electric flux, <clears throat> At time t equals one, we have, so this is t equals one, the electric flux is equal to just the magnitude of E times H times X times cosine of zero degrees at t equals two we've got the electric flux is the magnitude of E times H times X plus Delta X. And so the change in electric flux is just going to be E H Delta X. But, um, and so the change of electric flux over time is E H delta X delta T. Again, that's, that's a V. So we have an E H V. Um, and so the right hand side is going to give us mu zero epsilon zero um, E H V. Now the left hand side is just the integral of B dot DL around this rectangle. And here B is is down. So we have um, B down. Um, so that's going to be on the left. It's just going to be B times H. So that's this left side here. On the bottom here, uh, B is down, but DL is that way. So the flux is going to be zero. Sorry, not flux, B dot DL. Uh, on the right edge over here, B equals zero. So we've got zero for the right edge. And on the top, uh, again, magnetic field is down, but now DL is to the left. So the top, top is zero. And so that just gives us, um, a B times H. So putting this together, we have the left hand side we have B H equals E is equal to uh, a mu zero epsilon zero um, E H V and some H's cancel. 
And so we find that B is, therefore we get B is equal to mu zero epsilon zero E V. So now we have two results that we've derived. We have E is equal to BV, which came from Faraday's law, and we have B is equal to mu zero epsilon zero EV from the Ampere Maxwell's law. So we can put these two things together and solve for V. Um, so we can, since uh, E is equal to BV, we can just substitute that in here. And so we get B is equal to mu zero epsilon zero uh, B V times V. Uh, and so the B's cancel. And so we've got a one is equal to mu zero epsilon zero V squared or V is equal to one over mu zero epsilon zero. So what is that? So one over mu zero epsilon, um, if we just multiply by, uh, sorry, that's V squared is equal to four pi. If we just multiply by four pi over four pi, um, then we get V is going to be the square root of four pi over mu zero times one over four pi epsilon zero. And that's um, equal to one. This is going to be equal to one over one times 10 to the negative seventh. And this is nine times 10 to the ninth. <clears throat> and that's the square root of nine times 10 to the 16th, which gives us three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is indeed the speed of light. So it looks like the speed of Can you hear me or not? Yes, no? Yes, okay. So it looks like for this to work, um, for this to, the situation to be possible, this region of non-zero electric and magnetic field must be traveling at the speed we now know as the speed of light. And so what this is, is uh, an electromagnetic wave. So this is an electromagnetic wave. And in this electromagnetic wave, we find that the electric field, therefore, must be equal to in magnitude to, to the speed of light times the magnetic field. That comes from e equals BV. And the direction is restricted to, now not very surprisingly uh, in our, our uh, example here, picked a, a, a configuration of fields that was going to work. So we have E in the plus y direction, B 
in the plus z direction and v in the plus x direction. There's some other combinations that would not have worked. And more generally, um, we find that the direction of motion uh, is constrained in the following way that v hat, the direction, the unit vector in the direction of, of v is equal to the cross product of e hat cross b hat. So let's let's try this with our right hand and, and see if this works here. Um, e hat, the direction of E is is up in the plus y direction. Um, B hat is in the plus z direction, so you're gonna fold your fingers toward you, and that means your thumb sticks out in the plus x direction. Um, so that so these two things have to be true in our electromagnetic wave. Well, it is relativistic, isn't it? Because light is traveling at the speed of light. Um, and so it must travel at the speed of light. And it doesn't depend on your reference frame. One of the interesting things about the speed of light is that even if you're in a moving reference frame, the speed of light is still three times 10 to the eighth meters per second for you. Um, so let's, uh, let's actually try thinking through a question here. So let me, Get this question. And think about this for a minute. You stand at location A and you de detect a pulse of electromagnetic radiation. In the pulse, the electric field is in the negative x direction, and then the magnetic field is in the negative z direction. So what is the direction of propagation of this pulse of radiation? What, is, what does direction of propagation mean? We say the pulse propagates in the direction it's traveling. So this, is, this would be the direction of motion or the direction of propagation. So, Okay, so I want more than four answers. Okay. So everybody says minus y, so let's see, we have this would have to be negative x uh, cross negative z, thumb down. So indeed, negative y is correct. So very good. Um, what about if, <clears throat> Uh, what about if um, <clears throat> E, let's suppose E is in the plus X direction <clears throat> and the direction of propagation is the plus Y direction. What's the direction of, what's the direction of uh, magnetic field here? Uh, 
Yep, it would have to be negative Z, wouldn't it? Because we want uh, our thumb, be, when we're done with the cross product, our thumb needs to be pointing up and our fingers have to start pointing in the, the plus X direction. Let's see, how's that gonna work for you? Maybe I should do it this way. And so our fingers have to curl toward the negative Z direction. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we now can think a little bit more about um, the, the demo we saw at the, the beginning where we had an antenna, uh, we had an antenna here and we had a light bulb here. And if somehow electromagnetic radiation were, were traveling uh, from the antenna to this light bulb, then, and we, need, we definitely need an electric field that's going either uh, this way or that way to drive a current through the light bulb. Uh, it must be that the magnetic field was either in this radiation into or, or out of the page. And would this radiate, would electromagnetic radiation traveling through space, explain how we could get an electric field in the light bulb. Well, yes and no, because suppose we had kind of a big electric field to the left, say. Electrons would flow that way and pile up at the end of the wire and stop, and so the current would stop and the bulb would go out. And so uh, we would need something a little more complicated than just that single pulse of radiation that we saw to make that happen. But in fact, there are other configurations that would work. So for example, um, if we had, uh, A sinusoidal uh, electric and magnetic field oscillating, traveling through space. The electric field would go first one way and then another, and one way and then another. And the magnetic field would also be changing directions, even though the, the, the field is traveling here uh, to the right. Well, waves are waves, so it, 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 a wave, uh, a sinusoidal wave is a sinusoidal wave, right? And so if we had an electromagnetic wave that oscillated sinusoidally, it's going to have a lot in common with uh, a sound wave, which is pulses of compressed and, and rarefied air. Um, so sinusoidal, yeah, so it, so it does indeed. And so one possibility, and in fact, the way it does in fact work in our demo, is that the, uh, in that antenna, there's an alternating current and it produces a sinusoidal wave, oscillating wave that drives electrons through the light bulb, first one way and then the other, and one way and then the other. Why don't you see the light bulb flicker? Well, the light bulb never cools off enough to, uh, to go out during that time. So even though the current slows down, stops, and then reverses direction, it's doing that fast enough that the light bulb never gets to cool down, and so the light bulb actually stays lit in that demo. Now, the big remaining question here 
is uh, how do we actually produce how can how can this electromagnetic radiation be produced what is what is the source of the electromagnetic radiation and that will be our topic for next time we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about so next time we'll talk about where this radi how, how we could start such a wave going um, and so how do you know if, if a given pattern is valid or not well a given pattern has to satisfy Maxwell's equations but we found that a pattern satisfies Maxwell's equations if it's it's traveling through space in a particular direction and E and V are perpendicular to each other and also perpendicular to the direction of propagation in the sense that that E cross B has to be in the direction of V. Yep. And has to be, you know, the speed has to be the speed of light and the magnitude of the electric field has to be C times the magnitude of the magnetic field. So if all those things are true, which is what we derive from Maxwell's equations, then it works. Whereas if you have a pattern where E cross B is in some direction other than the direction you think the pulse is propagating, then it's not valid. So next time we will look at, at how we can produce uh, such a pulse. And you may be guessing that since we've hinted at it in the past, uh, it might be accelerated charges. Um, and that's exact, and that's correct. So we'll see that next time. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, this afternoon we'll uh, do some other things with Faraday's law and a little more application of Faraday's law and we'll also do a couple things with electromagnetic radiation. So see you later.